All right, let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer, asking for your blessing over this room. We pray that you'll surround us with your guardian angels and that you'll fill God with the Holy Spirit as he leads us through your word. We pray this in your holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I'll see all of you. And Roland, it's good to see you back. I know that it's not easy for you to be here without Helen, and we're glad that you're here, though. Thank you for being here with us. <laughs> Good to see all of you this morning. And like Abner said, if you do not have a harmony of the gospel, then please raise your hand and we can get you one. I don't know if anybody raised their hand, Abner, but it looks like everybody may have one. Now, as it turns out, today's scripture passage is only found in the gospel of John. And so if you don't have your harmony with you today, you'll be just fine. The Harmony puts the accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John side by side so that you can see the stories as they're told by the different Bible writers. Also, it places these in chronological order. And that's something that we're going to note today. The dates that are put in by the editor um, up here as the headings are helpful. And scholars debate just a little bit on some of these dates. And I'll have to admit that I find some uh, compelling evidence to not go exactly with the dates as they're given here by the editor. On the other hand, uh, these, are, these are good references. And today in particular, it makes a difference because what we're going to study today is the story of the first meeting between Peter and his brother Andrew and John, along with two others, Nathaniel and Philip, but I'm thinking particularly of the brothers, Peter and Andrew, and then John. Uh, we're later going to meet his brother, James, too. They're meeting Jesus here for the first time. And this is probably in the fall of either AD 26 or AD 27. And this is a good year and a half before the Sermon on the Mount. I say, what in the world does that have to do with anything? Well, the Sermon on the Mount comes midway into Jesus' three-year ministry. And it was actually the night before the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus spends all night in prayer. And then he chooses 12 to name them as apostles and then pulls them out from the other many followers, also known as disciples, that he wants to be with him in a special way to train and send them out. Now, the point is that we're looking at a good year and a half between when Jesus first meets Peter and Andrew and John, and when he calls them officially to become his apostles. It's a year and a half where they're hanging out with Jesus before they get that special commission. Now, one other thing that might be helpful, it's just slightly short of a year and a half. It's about a year and four months or so that we have between this meeting of Jesus with Peter and where he fills Peter's nets with fish and then says, come follow me. The reason all that is important is that if it weren't for the Gospel of John, and John is the only one who tells us this story, if it weren't for the Gospel of John, we might assume by reading in the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that the very first time that Jesus saw Peter, or James, or John, or Andrew, he called them to leave everything and follow him and come on the road with him full time. But they'd actually been hanging out with Jesus for about a year and a half before he gave them that call. Now, the reason I give you that background is I want us to think about following Jesus. I want us to think what it means to meet Jesus and to follow him and to realize all of us have different stories. And even the stories of the 12 that we call the apostles were all very different, different stories on how they came to follow Jesus. But something that we notice that seems to be a theme here is that Jesus gives us the time that we need to settle in, 
and to understand what it means to choose him and to follow him. And that's something that I want us to see today. What lens are we going to be looking at this story through? Well, the lens that, that I'm going to invite you to look at this story through is what it means to be introduced to Jesus and to introduce somebody else to Jesus and begin the process of following him. My guess is that most of you in this room and most of you online at some point made a conscious decision to be a follower of Jesus. Even if you grew up in a family that took you to church, that prayed regularly, that taught you Bible stories, and made following Jesus just a regular part of, of life, even if that's the sort of family you grew up in, probably at some point you made that decision for yourself and you're saying, this is what I'm doing. I'm choosing to follow Jesus for myself. I know for me that happened when I was about 13, 14. For some of you, it may have happened younger. For some of you, it may have happened older. And it may be that for some of you, you grew up in a family like that, and then you turned your back on Jesus, and you came back. But I want you to think about when you decided that you would be a follower of Jesus. Would you just think about that for a moment? When did you decide to become a follower of Jesus? What are the circumstances surrounding that? Who were some of the people that were influential in helping you to decide to become a follower of Jesus? Maybe some of you haven't thought about this for a long time. Maybe some of you have never thought about it. You've just kind of assumed that things went the way they went. And you've never given much thought about what influenced you to be a follower of Jesus. But I'm inviting you to think about that before we jump into this story today from the first chapter of John. How did you become a follower of Jesus? There might actually be some people here in the room today, maybe some people online, who would say, I'm not sure I am a follower of Jesus. I'm interested. I'm curious. I'm attracted but I'm, I'm not really sure I am a follower of Jesus. I'm, not, I'm sure I know exactly what that means. And if that's you, that's okay too. Because this story today is about becoming a follower of Jesus and in somewhat of baby steps, just taking some, some real baby steps in, in, in starting to become a follower of Jesus. So if you find yourself in the category of, I'm not sure if I'm a follower of Jesus, that's okay too. And this story is for you. Now, having introduced this story, what we're going to be looking at, that this is a story about starting to follow Jesus. I'd like to invite anybody, briefly, I know that for some of you, this could be a very long story. You could maybe take up the rest of the class period telling us the story on how you started to follow Jesus. But has anybody caught just a snippet of your story that you'd like to, to share with the rest of the class and saying, this is how I started following Jesus. And maybe here's a person or two that was influential in that decision for me. And I'd be open for three or four of you giving that just real briefly. Doug? Please. Roy, this, I think. This is Hi, Roy. Roy. Hi, Roy. Uh, I come from a family that is a fifth generation Adventist, so I, I've always been in the church more or less. However, when I was in my uh, late 20s, right after I was in the army, uh, I was studying Philippians 3, uh, verses 8 through 12, mm -hmm. and it really struck me what uh, Christ means to me Ooh. as an individual. Wow. And wow. That's what I consider the time when I started really following Christ. Thank you, Roy. And so it was really the um, story of Paul, because Paul is telling his own story there. Correct. It's the story of Paul that tugged at your heart to follow right. Jesus. Thank you. Somebody else? Uh, Please. About five years ago, 
my daughter and I were here singing and we came into this classroom and sat against that wall and watched you and Ken deliver a class that was phenomenal. And um, my wife came uh, the next Sabbath and it wasn't until we started coming here that we realized that the devil had very skillfully kept us away from church. Mm. And this is the class that actually showed you what Christianity was supposed to be. Wow. Wow. Thank you for that story, Abner. You know, the requisite at 12 years of age and then yep. in the 20s, but this was the class that actually showed me what being a Christian is about. Wow. Thank you, Abner. I'm just grateful, really grateful. Maybe one more. I said I had time for th for three or four. Anybody else briefly? Um, Marlene, did I see your hand? Yeah. So unlike Roy, I don't come from a Seventh-day Adventist family, rather from a split family where my parents were Catholics, my mom became a Seventh-day Adventist. And she started teaching my sister and I stories, Bible stories, stories from Jesus. But really what made a difference in my life was a friend I had when I was 13 or 14 years old. She was 30, 33 years old, much, much older, but she was a truly Christ-loving Christian. Wow. And her life and her desire to learn and to study the scriptures, the way she talked to me, it really inspired me and basically changed my whole life. Wow, wow. Thank you, Marlene. Let's let's use that one as the bridge into our Bible passage, because in Marlene's story, there is a specific person that you can point to. Now, not all of us have a specific person. Sometimes it's it's a handful of people, or sometimes, like with Roy, it may not be a person that you meet face to face. It might be a person that you are reading about, like he was reading about Paul and Paul's story. So all of us have different ways of starting to follow Jesus. John, the gospel writer, is telling us the story of the first five apostles and how they started following Jesus. We're going to read that story. I'm going to read it aloud here in just a moment. And, oh, just a second. We've got one more story to read here from somebody sending me an, a note uh, by, by text. Here's the story. I was raised in a Christian home, and that was ever a part of my psyche. However, about eight and a half years ago, through a dramatic and daunting life change at an older age, Jesus became very real to me and has consistently revealed himself to me in various ways. I am grateful to him and pray to be a faithful witness of his reality. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Really appreciate your, your comments. We're going to read this story from John. And John is telling us about these first five followers of Jesus who are becoming his apostles. Now, this is about a year and a half before he selects them as apostles, but they're beginning to follow him here. This is in John chapter 1 and starting with verse 35. If you're using the harmony, we're on page 34. And as you can tell, because over to the left, Matthew, Mark, Luke are blank, that means that Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't tell this story. John is the only one who tells this story. And so we're going to read John's account. And by the way, just... Just so you know, the Gospel of John is written by an eyewitness who is in this story. John puts himself into the story, but like storytellers story tellers sometimes do, John doesn't name himself. He introduces himself as that other guy, and you're going to see that here in just a minute. Now, later, he's going to go through the Gospel as an eyewitness and identifying himself as, as that guy and, 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 and this one and the friend of this one. But he will identify himself at the end of the gospel and say, by the way, that's me. And sometimes storytellers do that. You've, you've maybe heard people tell children's stories well, they're, where they will tell a story about some little kid misbehaving. And they tell the story in the third person. And then at the end of the story, they lean forward and they say, and do you know who that little boy was? And the kids say, who was it? And I say, it was me. That's how John is, is telling this whole story of Jesus. He names himself only at the very end of the gospel, but, 
but we know that this is him here as we piece the pieces together. He's the other one. So we'll, we'll notice that. But let's just read through the story right now. He's one of those first five. So here in John chapter one, starting with verse 35. And if you're in your harmony, this is page 34 and it's article number 28. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, wh where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the 10th hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what John had said and who followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother, Simon, and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching him, he said of him, here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you, you are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So there we have the first five. We have Andrew and another guy who are both disciples of John the Baptist. And that other guy is whom? Who did I say that other guy was? John. That's John. So just catch the connection here. Andrew and John already have a very sharpened focus on spiritual things and the kingdom of God and the announcement of the Messiah, because they're hanging out with John the Baptist. And now John the Baptist, as we've been studying the last couple of weeks, John the Baptist is saying, I'm not the main event. The main event is coming after me, and that's the one that has been promised for so long. It's the Messiah, and I'm nothing in comparison with him. The one who's coming after me is so great that I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie his sandals. So this is what John and Andrew have been listening to. They've been listening to John the Baptist talk about this. Meanwhile, Jesus has come and been baptized. And the dove has come down, Holy Spirit in the form of a dove, and the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. All of that has happened, possibly, presumably, John and Andrew were witnesses to some of this. And if we just turn back 
to article number 27 or in John chapter 1 verse 29 it says the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said look the Lamb of God now John and again we've we've got several Johns here did you notice that we have John the Baptist and then we have Simon's father whose name is John he's just referred to and then of course we've got John who doesn't name himself so there's several Johns it was a it was a common name then as it is now but it says the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and we say well what's what's the next day John who's writing this is giving a chronology of what happened this day and then this day and then this day and this day and he keeps saying the next day the next day the next day we've got about four days here in a row and so if you go back up to the article before that, or in, in the Gospel of John chapter 1, you'll see that what happens is what we studied last week, where we saw these leaders from Israel coming out, or I'm sorry, these leaders from Jerusalem coming out and asking, who are you? And they're demanding of John the Baptist who he is. And we studied that. We we saw how John was clear on his identity and who he was and who he wasn't. And then we have verse 15 of John chapter 1. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of Jordan where John was baptized. Verse 26 I baptize you with water, John replied, but among you stands one who you do not know. He was coming after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. So John has been consistently pointing toward the one who's coming. Then he baptizes them. Jesus disappears into the wilderness. The story of temptation, which John Cosgrove led us through so well. And then Jesus comes back about six weeks later. So what we've had is Jesus' baptism, his temptation, and now about six weeks later, he shows up again where John is baptizing. That's when all this story takes place. This is likely in the fall before the first Passover when Jesus is going to cleanse the temple and announce his ministry. So that gives you an idea of kind of the timeline that we're tracking with here. And when Jesus comes back out of the wilderness, John sees him. It's been about six weeks since his baptism. John sees him, and he says, now he wrote in verse 29 again, then the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist had not seen Jesus since he was baptized. He'd been out in the wilderness temptation for about the last six weeks 40 days now when he sees him again he points to him and he says look this is the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world this is the one i meant when i said a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me i myself did not know him but the reason i came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to israel then john gave this testimony I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. Of course, he's referring to the baptism of Jesus that happened about six weeks earlier. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. Now, this is all happening way out in the desert, about 20 or 30 miles away from Jerusalem, but the crowds have come out to find Jesus, I'm sorry, to come out to find John the Baptist, and now here, this passing of the baton is about to take place. John the Baptist has been the warm-up act for Jesus for months, and now Jesus is here. Jesus is about to take center stage, and John is ready to direct the attention away from himself and toward Jesus. And he does this first with a couple of his own disciples. Because now we read in verse 35, the beginning of our story for today. The next day. So you see, we've taken several days in succession. We have the day when the people come out to challenge John the Baptist. 
And we have then the day after that, when John sees Jesus and he says, look, this is the guy I was talking about. And then we have the next day after that, when John and Andrew, who are followers of John the Baptist, start following Jesus. And that's our story in verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. This is John and Andrew that he's with. When he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Now just pause there for a second. I want you to just let that sink in. John has been saying for months, I'm not the real deal. There's somebody coming after me who is the real deal. And it's him that I'm getting people ready for. And now the last few days, the curiosity of the crowd has been rising as John has been making more and more direct statements about who he is and who he's not. They've asked him a couple days earlier, are you the Messiah? He says, no, I'm not the Messiah. I'm helping people get ready for the Messiah. And then the next day he says, okay, there he is. That's the guy. And then the next day after that, Jesus comes by again. Jesus is apparently hanging out there with this crowd. And three days in a row, John's message about the Messiah has been ramping up. And now on this third day, he's standing there with John and Andrew. And he says, okay, that's him. That's the guy. And notice what they do. Verse 37. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. So just let that sink in for a second. And I want you to put yourself in John the Baptist's shoes. Here's two of your own helpers, two of your staff, two of your team members who have been working with you, who have been helping you with the work you've been doing over the last months. You see Jesus. And you say to these two trusted friends, that's the guy. That's the one I've been talking about. He's the one that we've been doing all this work for. And they turn their back on you and they start following Jesus. You just put yourself in John the Baptist's shoes. What are the thoughts? What are the feelings? What's going through you at this moment if you're John the Baptist? Talk to me. Gordon? You no, know, John, in order for John to be who he was, he had to have a special character and be very close to God. And I would think at that point he was thrilled. Yeah. You know? Yeah, he's thrilled. Yeah. Thank you, Gordon. Yeah, so one emotion that you picture, hang on just one thing, another one emotion that you picture going through John the Baptist, he's thrilled. He's saying, wow, these guys have been following me. I've been pointing people to Jesus and here he is and they're following Jesus. Mother, you, your turn. I, I think this testifies to the success of John as a preacher. He came yeah. to accomplish a certain uh, ministry and he's been successful with it. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's, He's when Jesus comes, they recognize him and they follow him. And mm -hmm. I think that should bring him great satisfaction to think that yeah. he has been successful in the mission that he was given to do. Yeah, thank you. So satisfaction. He is thrilled. There's a sense of satisfaction. Anybody else? Let me let me hear from one or two more. Yes. It reminds me of teachers yeah. and professors at the time of graduation. Uh, he has been with their students for four years. They nurtured them, they mentored them, they guided them, given their best. And then they rejoice when they graduate and are ready to go. I think it might be my some mixed emotions there, you know, yeah, not having yeah. that opportunity anymore. But that's the true uh, accomplishment of a, of a teacher. Oh, Marlene, you are just. Um ringing bells for me. Some of you know that I have been in higher education for the last 20 plus years. I started in 2000. And um, there are some students that you become so attached to. I have threatened some of my seniors. 
I've said, you know that I'm going to flunk you, don't you? So that you get to be around for another year. Mm -hmm. And um, at graduation time, when they leave, it, there is a mixed feeling because you think, wow, they are, they're moving on exactly as they should be. This is just exactly the way that things should be, but I'm going to miss them a lot. So <laughs> some mixed feelings. Yeah. Did I miss somebody? Was there another hand over here? Please, one more. John. Okay. One of the things I'm thinking John is feeling is, hey, this is great. I've done my job. I did it well. And it is complete. And then now where do I go? What do I do? And who do I do yeah. it with? Yeah, yeah. Are you useless now? Good comment. Okay, we've got a comment here in the chat. Let me read this one. In my own life experience, when I wondered if God was saying my particular calling was over or finished, my big question was, well, what? Now what? Hey, uh, John, you were anticipating. It's the same comment. Thank you. What now? And, and that could be something that John is asking. What now? What do I do now? Because I'm watching people who I had working closely with me. Now they're following Jesus. One more comment. We're going to make one more comment. I have always wondered why John himself didn't turn and follow Jesus. Wow. Mm -hmm. Why didn't John turn and follow Jesus? Why doesn't he say, okay, I'm going to become one of those who go on the road with you? Anybody have a thought on that? Uh, so got, I have a question. I, I thought we have two that. two comments here. I thought about that myself and realized that maybe John said to himself, "If I tag along with Jesus, because I myself have had my own disciples, I will be a distraction to his ministry." Amen. So I wow. I fall back and allow him to fully take the the, the stage. Yeah. Well, wow. which would be very um, compatible with what he said later when he said, I must decrease, he must increase, and I'm not going to be there possibly distracting from him. Good comment. I think we have one comment over here, and then I got one online, and then we'll, we're going to move forward. Oh, two here. So John and then uh, the gentleman over on the other side of the aisle. Please, John. I think what I admire about John the Baptist is that he started his ministry with a purpose. And his purpose never changed. He didn't get sucked away from with the distractions that could be very self-serving. I mean, for example, the leaders of the church at that time, even the leaders of the church at this time, probably may have very well started out oftentimes with very wholesome, selfless purposes. But over time, something happens. And pretty soon other things begin to melt in and career pressure take over, maybe, maybe you're you need to be more motivated by money or financial reward, and your purpose somehow gets distracted by that wholesome, selfless purpose. So it makes me ask myself, you know, what's, what's, what's my purpose? What's my reason? And am I still on target? And so John the Baptist made no bones about it, that his purpose was to prepare the way of the Lord. That was his purpose. And he never, ever lost track of that. Even yeah. to the end, he never lost track of that. So he certainly is somebody to give him. Right? Yeah. Great comment. Thank you, John. Now we've got another comment on the other side of the aisle. And I'm sorry, I heard your name and I don't remember it. Remind Ryan. me again. Ryan. I'm sorry. Ryan. Ryan. Uh, actually, I'm your case, please. Out of my mouth. So that was pretty much exactly what I was going to say. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let me read the one that just came in as a text. Although John was conceived, named, and birthed for this very time, and God uh, had blessed John with spiritual success, yet it would be very likely Satan tempted him to feel left behind. To his credit, he obviously resisted any temptations along those lines. And that's really a reinforcement of what you just said, John Cosgrove. Okay, let's let's move forward. Oh, we got one more comment. Brief comment, John, and then I want to move forward in the story. This is a question. Jesus himself said that there was none greater than John the Baptist. Why would not Jesus no. John the Baptist a new assignment? Let me make sure I heard the last part. Why would Jesus not give John the Baptist a new assignment? Is that your question? Yes, sir. Yeah, good question. Um, I would Doug, like to suggest that he, he, oh, hang on just a second. Who's speaking here? Doug, Roy? Roy. Yes. Please, Roy, go ahead. Uh, John's work had not fin been finished yet. 
there is a statement in, in great controversy where Ellen White talks about that there will be a greater result uh, at Christ's second coming than the first. And so the result for the first coming was to be about 10% of Jerusalem became Christian by, by 70 AD. And so the work that John was doing was to help build that entourage that became Christians uh, out of the Jews in Jerusalem. Thank you, Roy. And I'm going to respond, um, John, to your question just real briefly, and then I want us to move on, because this is not the last time that we'll get to take a look at John the Baptist. He is going to be um, part of the story a little bit later on. So we'll come back to him. I, I want us to look at the other parts of the story and not, not just on the John the Baptist, but let's take just a moment on your question, and that is, I believe that Jesus actually did give him another assignment. And what I'm going to suggest that assignment is, is, is not a pleasant one. His next assignment was to be a prisoner. Yes. And, and we'll, we'll come back to that when we read the story about his imprisonment and about his death. But to just put it real briefly, John the Baptist is remember the bulldozer plowing the way ahead for Jesus. If you stop and think about it, the most appropriate way for John the Baptist to keep bulldozing ahead of Jesus is to die before Jesus dies. It's very appropriate that the one who goes the way to pave the way would almost mirror some of the steps that Jesus is going to take. And before Jesus dies, John dies at the hands of careless people who don't appreciate him. And so in many ways, John's life is continuing to have its purpose as he's still going ahead of Jesus. Again, not to be trite, but as the warm up act. And John's death is in some ways just a little bit of a foreshadowing of Jesus' death. So that's all I'll say on that. But he did get another assignment and, and it was, it was a, a very sobering assignment. Let's keep going with this story for today though. So we're here in John chapter one. And we made it as far as verse 37. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked them, what do you want? Let me just pause here for a second. There's so many good things in this story. And I don't want to take too much time to look at two different, too many different pieces of scenery. But I want to look at the scenery that helps us get to our main point here. And that is understanding about meeting Jesus and becoming a follower of him. There is a principle throughout scripture that the very first time that something is mentioned, the very first time that something is introduced, usually the Bible writer is selecting that story and that particular way of telling the story to give us a picture of everything that's going to come. And in the Gospel of John, this is the first words out of Jesus' mouth. As John is telling the story of Jesus, this is Jesus' first statement. And it's actually a question. And that's significant that as John is introducing Jesus, the very first words that he records out of Jesus' mouth are a question and they're a particular type of question. And look at that question again. What is the question? Look at it there in, in verse 38. What do you want? Now, we won't take time to review everything that John has said so far. But John is crafting his story beautifully. From beginning to end, John's gospel is a piece of literary artwork. And this is no accident that the very first thing out of Jesus' mouth that he records is this question. And telling this story as he does about people who are starting to follow Jesus. And the first question that he records of Jesus is, what do you want? Now, maybe this seems over obvious, but I'm going to ask you to put it into words. Why is this so significant? What is John trying to tell us about Jesus? John Cosgrove? 
Uh, again, I, I got to go back to what I reflected on before is what's your reason? What's your purpose? I mean, I mean, Jesus' objective is not to follow John Cosgrove. John Cosgrove's objective is to follow Jesus. Jesus doesn't follow me. I follow him. So what's my purpose? And so Jesus wants us to reflect on what do we want? And it's a difficult question sometimes. That's sometimes really hard to answer. What do you want? Particularly when all this stuff in our lives gets mixed up in this. I think a better word yeah. is okay. What are you seeking? Because that's really what he's asking it. Yeah. Yeah. What are you seeking? Was that Tiffany? Was that you speaking up, Tiffany? Yes, sir. I think I think I heard somebody. Anybody else want to speak to this? Why is this important that the very first words out of Jesus' mouth in oh, here's another one on, online. Similar to God asking Adam after Adam's rebellion, where are you? In order to help Adam recognize his position, just so Jesus asks, what are you seeking for their benefit? Yes, have you ever thought about that? Years ago, many years ago, probably eight, 10 years ago in this class, we just studied the questions of Jesus. We spent, I don't know, several months looking at a bunch of them. There's a lot more than we studied. And one of the things that we came to discover is that Jesus never asked a question that he didn't already know the answer to. But when he asked a question, he was getting people to think. He wanted them to think about the question he was asking. And so, very good point. Let's take a look at what happens here. When Jesus says, what do you want? It really is asking us to think, what do I want? What am I seeking? What's important to me? And that's a question that Jesus is asking all of us all the time. And it's the very first words out of Jesus' mouth in the Gospel of John. What do you want? Now, I think that like you just said, John, is that this was not an easy question to answer. And in this moment, if we're just sticking with the, with the moment of the story, here's John and Andrew who have been following John the Baptist, part of his team, and now they are starting to follow Jesus, literally following him, kind of like a puppy dog following somebody home. And, and Jesus turns around and looks at them and says, well, what do you guys want? And they don't know exactly how to answer, I don't think, because what comes out of their mouth is not necessarily profound. It's, it's very tactical and practical. They say, and I think somewhat fumbling and stuttering, they say, Rabbi, so they're acknowledging him as a, as a teacher. Uh, where are you staying? No, <laughs> that's not a profound question, but it's a very practical question because the implication is we'd like more time with you. Where are you staying? And, and it's almost like inviting himself home. If I was to use the analogy again of a, of a puppy following you. We, we want some more time with you. We've heard what John the Baptist has to say, but we really would like some more time. Tiffany, please. So this makes me think about what a precious character, what how sweet God is, that this right here depicts our freedom of choice. This is where he gives us, yeah. he shows his character of where we have that free choice of human will where we can make the decisions. And this right here just starts to show how hungry we are for Jesus. Yes, uh, yes. And that's, yeah. that's what I think about when I think about this story. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Yes. Douglas? Yes, yes please, it, Mother. It, it, it also shows to me that they are not willing to just take John's word for who Jesus is and what he is. Yes. They want to know from him himself. Tell us yeah. what you're all about, who you are. Yeah. And this is going to take time. And they don't want to just stand on the street corner and talk. They right. want to go sit in a good place where it's comfortable and spend yeah. some time with him and find out yes. what are you all yes. about. Yes. yes. They want to see for themselves. Yes. John, this brought some. Thank you, brother. This brought something to your mind too, John. Also, when, when getting back on the seeking thing, um, I, I mean, I think probably the right answer from the disciples 
what do you want? They, I think if they were really going to be honest at that point in time, they would have said, I just don't know what I want. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. What I want, but I'm willing to try to find out. Hence, yeah. <laughs> what do you want? Yes. Oh, let me seek to find out what I do want. And again, that's no different. They were already missing. That's no different than they. You know, right. You know, I don't know what I want. <laughs> Yes, excellent, excellent. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't really know. Gordon, please. I was just thinking that a separate way of looking at this is how effective John was. Yeah. Two of his close disciples, he's been talking to them about Jesus, not about himself. Right, right. And the minute they see Jesus, they go. Yeah. You know, right. that's unusual if you really think about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they've been close to this guy, and they just yeah, walk. yeah. No, it is. It, it is. If you just look at this from a friendship standpoint, they are turning their back on somebody they've been very close to, they've worked closely with for some time. But the attraction of Jesus is so great that they are are making that choice. And I imagine there's mixed feelings there too. Okay, one more comment and then we need to move forward. Please, John. In my mind, I would be like the disciples that are asking for you could stay when really what I wanted to say is, I've been with John all this time, but I still have a hope in my heart. Would you fill it up, please? Mm, mm, yeah, good. And there's one more comment online. Uh, excellent comment. Jesus asked this question, what do you want? Uh, of people throughout his ministry. And that's true. We, we've seen that before. Jesus gives us choice of following him or not. He is available to us. He seeks us, but doesn't force the relationship. That is such a beautiful theme throughout this whole story we're looking at today. It's, it's an invitation, but it's not a, uh, a heavy-handed uh, command. Okay, there's another comment here online, and then we are going to move forward. Uh, let's see here. The comment is, let's see here. I'm having a hard time get, getting to it. Perhaps they ask where Jesus is staying in order to assess whether or not they want to actually follow him. Is there someone they want to be associated with? Is this someone they want to be associated with? Jesus' answer is just vague enough to capture their curiosity. Jesus doesn't dialogue about it, doesn't verbally explain. He simply says, Come and see how profound. Yeah, that's a great comment. And so let's go to that part of the story. So here they say, um, Rabbi, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. And I think the profundity is not just, oh, yeah, I'm at the Motel 6 down, room number 342. It's come and, and, and you'll see. There's, there's much more in this you'll see. It's, it's not you're going to see which, which room in the am I in. You're going to see a lot more than you expected to see. I think and, at that point, that's where he welcomes them into their presence, his presence. You know? Yes, 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 you Tiffany. Like, follow me or whatever. It is. Come and be with me in my, in my space, in my time. Be with me. Yes, excellent. Another comment here in the chat. Knowing human nature, was there possibly an attraction to the power and status of finding the Messiah? Oh, yeah. Thank you, Beth, for that. The idea that that Jesus is somebody pretty important. And, and there could be mixed motives here. The desire of connecting yourself, yourself with something big, something great, and knowing that you're kind of on the inside track there, the, the, the foundation level. Yeah, there could be that too. Okay, let's Devin, keep going with the story. Is there another Devin, comment? Yes, Mother, just please. Just quick, quickly, ultimately, where Jesus dwells is with his disciples. Yeah. He doesn't have a dwelling place on earth. Yeah, it's yeah. it's with with all of us. That's Excellent. the ultimate. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, let's me keep moving because there's a lot more in this story, and I want to see at least the the major outline of it here before we before we have to close class. So they went and saw where he was staying, and spent that day with him. And you see how the days we're, we're ticking through the days here. They spent that day with him. So there's a, there's a whole day here that goes by. We have no record of it other than that it happened. But obviously they are talking a lot 
And what happens next gives us some idea of what that conversation sounded like, because they start saying some things in their conversation that obviously is reflecting their conversation with Jesus. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the 10th hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother, Simon, and tell him, we found the Messiah. That is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now, again, rich, rich detail in that tiny little chunk of the story. But notice this. We have the very first thing he does. So after spending this day with Jesus, the first thing he does, he's, I want to get my brother in on this. And so he goes, finds his brother, Simon. And then when he finds him, he says, with great clarity, simplicity, brevity, confidence, we have found the Messiah. And then he doesn't just talk. He does something. He brings him to Jesus. And then notice this interaction. I love this, this first meeting of Jesus and Peter. Jesus looked at him and said, you're Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Now we have record of Jesus nicknaming several of the disciples. And it starts right here. Right here at the very beginning, Jesus gives him nicknames. And of course, the nickname is Rock, or you might even think of Rocky. His given name is Simon, but Jesus looks at him and he says, no, you're Rocky. And again, we could delve into that, and, I, and I'm, I'm not going to take time to, but I just want you to catch the cadence here. There's a, there's a friendliness. There's a familiarity. Uh, there is... There is even a bit of a playfulness, but the playfulness always has something deeper beneath it. But there's a beauty in the simplicity. And I want you to notice also that these five guys all know each other, or at least know somebody else in the group of five. And, and that's significant too. Keep reading here, and then we'll, we'll do some general observations because we're, we're running close to the end of our class time. But I want you to, to get the big picture here as we're going through it. We have found the Messiah, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter or the rock. The next day, now you see what John is doing here? John is telling us what's happening on about four or five successive days. He is that other disciple. So it's Andrew and John that were the disciples of John the Baptist. And he's recounting as an eyewitness what happened each of these days. Now, something else that's helpful to notice here is the geography. That where we are at this point in the story is quite a ways south of Galilee. If you look on the map, and maybe some of you have maps handy, or you can call one up online quickly, you will see that the Jordan River runs north and south between the Sea of Galilee, that is up in the region of Galilee, and the Dead Sea, which is down in the region of Judea. And so here we have the Jordan River running north and south, and we know that where John the Baptist is baptizing is on the other side of the Jordan. Everything is in reference to Jerusalem. So when we say the other side of, of Jordan, we know it's on the far side of the river from, from Jerusalem. That means that we are at a minimum 20 miles away from Jerusalem, out in the desert. And if you look straight out from, from Jerusalem, you'll see that the Jordan River is about 20 miles, give or take, out from Jerusalem. So we're, we're somewhere in that vicinity. Now, to go from Jerusalem up to the Sea of Galilee is about 75 miles. And again, give or take where they are, but we're not talking about just across the street. We're talking about having to walk a great distance. And again, depending on where you're going in Galilee, if you consider walking at about three miles an hour, average people walk at about two and a half to three miles an hour, you're talking at about 20 plus hours of walking. Now, most of us are not used to that. 
you know, most of us do well to find the closest parking space at Walmart and, you know, walk from our car to, to the door of Walmart. These guys were pretty hardy. And you look at where Jesus is walking. He's walking 15 miles, 20 miles, 10 miles. You just look at the map and see where he's going these days. And, and they're, they're covering some ground. And so depending on exactly where they are along the Jordan, they are some 50 to 70 miles away from Galilee, and they're setting out walking. Now, possibly they had animals to ride on, but there's absolutely no record of that. And so the best we can assume is that what's mentioned more is that he's walking, is that he probably is walking here. So let's look at the story in light of that. So it says the next day, verse 43, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. So they can take off straight north, and go up to Galilee, which is some 50 to 70 miles, again, depending on where they're going from the desert to which part of Galilee, to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Now, Bethsaida is a little town near Capernaum on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Now, whether he found Philip up there in his hometown, or he found him somewhere in between, we don't know, but that's where he's from, and that's where Jesus is heading with this little group of new followers. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. And of course, you remember that Nazareth is also up in Galilee. All of these guys have connections to Galilee. That's where Jesus grew up. That's where Philip and Andrew live. That is where um, John comes from. They're all, they're all out of their element, actually, down there in the desert where John is preaching. They're heading back to where all of them have roots. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we found the one that Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Now let's just pause there for a moment. We'll come back to that question. We're not going to spend a lot of time. on it. Our time is, is pretty rapidly running out on us here. But I want to come back to this big question of people meeting Jesus. I've already mentioned that all these people know each other. Some of them quite well because they are related. Others of them we're going to see later are business partners. It appears as if James and John run a small fishing business and Peter and Andrew run a small fishing business. And it appears as if they work together at times. So they know each other through business, through work. We have James and John who are brothers. We have Peter and Andrew who are brothers. Then we've got Philip and Nathaniel who know each other. And they come from the same town as the brothers do. So there's, there's connections here. This is the very first story of people starting to follow Jesus. This is the first story of people introducing others to Jesus. John is very selective with his stories. He's the only one who tells this story, and he tells it in some detail. What might John be wanting to tell his readers about what it means to follow Jesus by telling these stories in this great detail. Let me hear from a couple of you. John, I mean, uh, Doug, I've been thinking a lot about uh, these few verses here because the question that Jesus asked, what do you want? To me, Jesus knew what they wanted. Jesus knew what they needed. They needed to realize the true motives, okay? And then when they say, where are you staying? You know, it's who want to spend time with you, basically what they're saying is Jesus brings them to their home. At other times when people ask him, where are you staying? They said, foxes have a place where they live and, and versa. Okay. Then, I mean, nest, but I don't have a place. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to make sure that with this selected group, they knew the true motives of what it means to follow Jesus, to be a friend of Jesus. And through his gospel and his books, 
and then uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, John the Evangelist is trying to lead us to the motives of following Christ because of who he is. That's how it is. Mm. Following Jesus because of who he is. Thank you. Douglas. <clears throat> Thanks, Marlene. Yes, Mother. <clears throat> I think the key is in that verse that says they spent the day with him. And well, after they spent the day with him, that is what changed them. And they were then in not just mere followers anymore, but they were truly disciples and set out to make more disciples. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's the same when we spend time with Jesus that is what is going to change us. Yeah, yeah. Spending time with Jesus and then wanting to introduce other people to it. One more comment, please. I, I just to follow on that, I was thinking the same thing. I, when reading this the first time, I was struggling with uh, verse uh, 39 there where it says, it was about the 10th hour. I'm thinking, that seems like a really arbitrary point to include in this. Like, why would John have put that in there? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I, I think it's really it's emphasizing the point. It was already ten o'clock in the morning when they when they met him, and he was saying, "Look, they had from ten o'clock until evening to spend with him, and that span of time was enough to utterly change their life." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where they couldn't stop talking about. Yeah, yeah. Excellent point. And and Keith, you have a, a comment, please. Just logistically. It's important where we place ourselves because we were talking about the next day and the next day in the distance. Peter must have been in the area also. Yes. Yeah. We don't know after that for sure because 43 says he decided to leave for Galilee and then finding Philip. We don't know where he was at. Right. Whether Philip was local or whether clear up in Galilee. But logistically, uh -huh. it says you need to put yourself in good places to to get uh, what happens <laughs> in those good places. <laughs> yes, excellent. And at this moment, the good place was around John the Baptist. That's where things were were buzzing about the Messiah. Okay, one more comment, please. If once upon a time you told us uh, when John wrote this, I don't remember, but it was quite some time after this happened. Yeah. These details to have stuck in his mind the next day, the yeah. tenth hour. That that's pretty impressive to me. Uh, yeah. If this many years later. Yes. Excellent thought. Yes, John is writing this as an old man, and it's very likely that he was either in his early twenties or possibly even late teens when he follows Jesus. So yeah, this is decades later, and that in itself is significant that this was such a life-changing event. He remembers what happened. Yeah, day. Yes, Mother. Um, I have a question as well as a comment. It's interesting to note that the people that we're talking about in this story were either disciples of John, who John pointed to Jesus, mm -hmm. or they went and found somebody mm -hmm. and brought them to Jesus. But Jesus found Philip. Yeah. Yeah. He was not brought by someone else. So we right. don't know, was he a disciple of John or not? We don't. Yeah. No. So that, that was There's so much that we. Yeah, that, that Philip was, and it just shows it still, there are people that Jesus calls directly an invitation yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look at the stories we heard at the beginning of our, our class today. Marlene's story was much more about somebody that she knew, that she admired, um, who helped her come to Jesus. Roy's story was much more about quietly being alone, reading the Bible himself, and God spoke to him directly that way. It's true. There's all different ways that we come to Jesus. I am so sorry. We are down to the last few minutes of our time together. I do have one more comment that came here as a text. It says, in John's description of those inviting others, perhaps the author's intent is for his readers to begin sharing where they are in their world. Amen. Yes. Because you see that there's, there's sharing of network here. That yes, there's a time and place to talk to strangers. But there's also a very important time to talk to the people around us and say, guess what's becoming important in my life? You want to hear what's really making a difference for me? 
sometimes it's harder to share that with the people that we're closest to and almost easier to share that with strangers. But this is certainly a story about sharing people, sharing with people that you know, that you're related to, that you're close with. And, and it, it's not this banging people over the head with the Bible sort of a picture. It's saying, hey, this is really something good that, that, that's making a difference for me. I'd like you to hear about it. That's the tone of this story. Now, I'm, I'm tempted to just go straight to our application, and maybe that's what I should do. Let's just leave dangling this little conversation between Jesus and Nathaniel. It is precious, and it's powerful, but we're going to leave that dangling. Let's come to the application, because this is really important. And that is, for those of you that have spent a number of years in the church, you probably have heard pastors, you've heard others who have said, you need to talk to people about Jesus. You need to, you need to witness. You need to bring people to Jesus. You, you've probably heard various exhortations about witnessing what it means, and maybe even felt a little bit guilty, or maybe felt inadequate. You may have had all kinds of feelings about it. Maybe you've had some really good feelings. Maybe you've had some good, good experiences. I want you to just focus on this story for the moment. Just pretend that this story is the only uh, the only content on that subject at the moment, just from this story. And what we have looked at from this story today, what is God saying to you about witnessing, about your following Jesus and about maybe being a part of other people's following Jesus, influencing others? Is there anything, glance back over the story, Rewind in your head some of the things we've talked about. Is there anything in this story that is instructive, that is inspiring, that is challenging for you? Maybe a new idea, maybe reinforcing an old idea. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus and to influence somebody else to be a follower of Jesus? Let me hear from several of you on that. Okay, so here we have... Um, another comment, be genuine. Yeah, I love that. And then here, the backdrop to the whole book is about his mission to bring the kingdom. So everything needs to be seen in the light of this fact. Following him means entering God's kingdom. So everything else is really superfluous. Yeah, excellent. And then I got one online here. Let's see. Um, living my life in such a way that my come and see has influence. Oh, I love that. Come and see. That's pretty powerful. It's not even come and hear. It's come and see. Please, run. I think the takeaway for me uh, that, that really drove home reading this is it's only through spending time with Christ that we can be effective witnesses. But it's yes. that, coming back to that uh, verse 39, if we aren't spending time with him, if we aren't exposing ourselves to him, the motivation it's impossible for us to be genuine in our witness. Like yeah. the thing that's required for witnessing is for us to be in God's presence. Yeah, yeah. Oh yes, being in God's presence is what gives me something that that I have something to say. Come and see. It, it makes me a different person. Got oh, it. terrific stuff! Please, anybody else? We're going to wrap up with a couple comments here. You and I were talking about this earlier this week by email about the chosen. Yeah. How they're doing a really good job of portraying the Jesus that is a common man Jesus instead of what mm -hmm. I as a slow motion moving version. Yeah. 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 See Jesus that's down on his back fixing the axle on somebody's wagon. You see yeah. Jesus yeah. is sweating, tired, caring for those around him. And yeah. Jesus that we need to see that it it draws that part of us to give to other people repeatedly even when it hurts and that's it's something that we really need to see. Roy's got a comment. Yeah. Yes. Roy, we're gonna make here's the last comment here. All right. I wanted to say at the end down here, it's easy to give in to the temptation of doubt, hmm. especially when you're in trouble and things are happening that are destructive in your life and the end of what jesus says here 
our John says here is that, you know, wait and see yeah. and see the glory of God yeah. and so forth. And that is so encouraging when a person is struggling. It is. And, and Roy, I said I was going to skip that, but you've you've mentioned it briefly. And I hope that the rest of you will take a, a look at the end of this story, because it is a powerful story. story. And it, it ends somewhat the way that it began. And that is Jesus says, come and see. And at the very end of the story, he says, Nathaniel, come along. You're going to see more. It, it, it really is this whole thing. Come and see. And it's much like what the psalmist says. He says, oh, come and taste that the Lord is good. God is calling us to an experience. When we have an experience that tastes good, that looks good, that is good, we have something to share with others. And our witness then is not so much banging people over the head, trying to convince them, trying to argue into, argue them into position that we have found convincing. It really is much more like what Jesus says, come and see. This has been good for me. Maybe it would be good for you too. And I think that's the spirit of this whole story. Come and see. And if we have something worth seeing, other people are going to be attracted to it in the same way that John and Andrew were attracted to Jesus and wanted to tag along behind him. So Marge, Abner, I don't know if you have anything that you want to do to close out class there in Ken's absence. Uh, if not, I don't mind just closing out with prayer. Go ahead, John. Okay, I'll do that. <clears throat> Father, I want to see your beauty. And I ask on behalf of everybody here in this class that, that we will want to see your beauty. That we'll want to admire Jesus. We'll want to be curious. We'll want to be drawn. And that we will be drawn. We will be eager to see more and more of Jesus. And then by hanging out with him, by listening, by watching, that we will be changed. And that by becoming more like Jesus, we'll start using his methods, even his, his phrases, his words, his approach. And that people will be drawn to Jesus through us. May that happen, Lord. Wherever we are, in our following of you, if we're just at the very beginning baby steps, or if we've been following you for some time, I ask that we will take the next steps, becoming more mature, more engaged, and more like Jesus. May that happen for us. Thank you for what we've been able to do together in this class today. In Jesus' name, amen. Good to be with you all. Thank <laughs> you.